Welcome in to Locked On Phillies. I'm your host, Connor Thomas, talking Phillies for 97.5 The Fanatic Sports Radio. And now with you here for Locked On Phillies. Today, we have an awesome show for you. Starting out, we're doing some cool new stuff around all of the Locked On MLB channels where we rank our teams within the division. Today, we're going to be talking about the NL East pitching rotations and where the Philadelphia Phillies rank. We also have our latest um, free agent spotlight. And we'll also get into some MLB lockout updates to wrap everything up. It's going to be a great show. Thank you for making Locked On Phillies your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get started. You are Locked On Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, Every day. That's right. We are back here on Locked On Phillies. Like I said, we're going to jump right into it. A cool thing we're doing for all of the Locked On MLB channels. You can find it across all of our MLB YouTube channels, podcasts, everything. We're going to be ranking our teams in certain aspects among the division. So, of course, we're ranking where the Phillies stand in the NL East, a variation of different aspects. But where we're starting today is the starting pitching rotation. Now, the cool thing, when everything's all said and done, you guys from Locked On Braves, Locked On Mets, Locked On Nationals, Locked On Marlins, we'll all have a roundtable. We'll discuss where we each individually rank our teams among the NL East. And getting a little bit of an argument, I'm sure, about who ranked themselves too high, who ranked other teams too low. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to cover this over the coming episodes and get you all primed and ready for opening day, whatever that is. So without further ado, let's jump in. Today, we're talking NL East pitching rotations. And for me, this is a fun place to start out. You're going to see when everything's all said and done where I have the Philadelphia Phillies ranked. But first, let's start from the bottoms. Coming in at number five in the NL East pitching rotations for me, it's the Washington Nationals. At the trade deadline last year, the Nationals basically tanked out, sold off almost all their roster, including Trey Turner, one of their brightest young stars, proved that they're not interested in winning right now. They're going to try and rebuild behind Juan Soto, who turned down a huge contract from the team reportedly this offseason. I don't know what they're doing. Washington's kind of a dumpster fire. Now, when you look at their pitching rotation, they're not helpless. The top end of the rotation is still Steven Strasburg, Patrick Corbin. Those are names that you hear and you think, okay, good MLB arms. But, of course, there's one guy missing there who was their ace for a long time, who we'll talk about a little bit later as we go through these rankings. But Strasburg, aging. Patrick Corbin coming off a season in which he had a five-plus ERA. He is not, has not been, rather. Uh, recently what they thought they were getting when they signed him in free agency a couple years back. And then the rest of the rotation, the back end, leaves some to be desired. You have Josiah Gray, who's a younger arm. He's got a chance to figure some stuff out, but he's not ready to be a proven arm in a rotation yet. It may come with time, but for the upcoming season, he's not really a third arm in a winning rotation. That's probably the position that he'll employ with the Nationals in 2022. You follow that up with Joshua Rogers, who, I mean, he's been around a little bit. He's okay, but he's another guy that's just like, "Eh, shrug your shoulders. What does he give you? It's basically the back end of their rotation is milk toast. It's like, okay, these guys are MLB arms, I guess, but it doesn't give you anything to get excited about. Really, Strasburg and Corbin don't give you all that much to be excited about at this point in their careers, which is why I have the Nationals ranked as fifth. And then rounding out their rotation, Paolo Espino will probably fill that fifth spot. Uh, He's an aging player who does not have much MLB experience. Even though he is older, he's just not really an MLB starting caliber arm. And he's going to get an opportunity, a cool opportunity, because of the lack of depth the Nationals have basically across their roster. Uh, Good luck to him. He's going to need it because he doesn't have much to cover him in this rotation and he doesn't have much as the fifth arm in what is the fifth best rotation, in my opinion, in the National League East. Let's move on to fourth. This team made a little bit of news earlier today. 
Derek Jeter stepping down as chairman of the Miami Marlins. Well, they're coming in and he's leaving the fourth best rotation, in my opinion, in the NLEs. Now, this one, I'm the most worried about putting forth. I think they have the highest upside relative to the position I'm ranking them in, just because some of their arms are real young, but real talented. I think they're a year or two away from being a really dangerous rotation. Let's go through it. Sandy Alcantara, you already know what he is. He's already a veteran pitcher in Major League Baseball. He's going to come out and be the ace of the staff, and he's going to give them really good innings this year, just like he did last year, just like he did the year before. He's a guy that you can count on to get you probably upwards of 175 strikeouts. Uh, he's going to have a sub-4 ERA. He's going to lead the staff. That's a guy that you can build a rotation around. Trevor Rogers, a great number two as well. Those are two guys that if you start out your rotation with those two, you could be an over 500 ball club. Now, the Marlins have other issues in the field and with the rest of their roster, but the top two in their rotation, I give them the nod over the top two in Washington's rotation right now, which is a big part of the reason that I rank them above the Nationals. And you're going with Pablo Lopez, Elisa Hernandez, and Jesus Lazardo, probably rounding out those final three spots in the rotation. All young arms, all guys that you can go ahead and look at as – Hey, they've got talent, but they haven't overly produced at the major league level yet. So how much stock can we give young talent without seeing what they actually do at the major league level first? Uh, it, it's tough for me. I like the proven arms over the ones that are young. And in another division, the Nationals, the Nationals, the Marlins rather, could crack the top three because of the youth and the talent that they have just in NL East that you're going to see with these next three teams is pretty stacked when it comes to starting rotations. I got to keep the Nationals in fourth place. Something that's interesting to watch, a name that I didn't mention that if you're a fan of the Marlins or if you just follow NL East baseball in general, like, well, where's uh, Sixto Sanchez? Yeah, the former Phillies prospect, he's coming off a shoulder surgery that ended his 2021 season prematurely. If he does get back in time and he's healthy, he could crack into the rotation for sure and give them some solid innings. An uber-talented young player. We'll have to see how he was balanced from that injury. Right now, on the outside looking in just because of that shoulder recovery. But if he comes back, he adds another potent arm to that rotation. That's another part of the reason where I think this could be the team that I look back when the season's over and be like, wow, I kind of underrated their rotation a little bit. But let's go ahead and look at number three and show you why the Marlins are where they are. Now, number three, I promise I'm trying not to be biased on this. I, I detest the Atlanta Braves. They annoy the heck out of me, but that's not why they're here. The other two rotations we're going to go through, I'll make my case for why I believe that they're better than what the Atlanta Braves will trot out in 2022. And that's no knock to the Braves because this rotation is really, really good. You're starting out with Max Freed, who – is a number one in a rotation level pitcher. He's a guy that was a huge part of their run to being a MLB champion last year and winning the World Series. Uh, he's probably going to go for another 170 strikeouts this year. He's another guy that you can just pencil him in for like a 3-5 ERA every single year. He's, I mean, going to probably win him 14 games too because that team is amazing. Like they're returning, well, we'll see what happens with Freddie Freeman, but they're returning a lot of young players that should improve at the points they are in their career from that World Series winning roster. So that's a benefit for this pitching staff as well. But looking just at the talent of the rotation, the one in Max Reed, I'm cool with that. He's a solid one. He's not a top-level, like, ace-level number one, but you can build a rotation around that guy. Charlie Morton and two. Charlie Morton had a strong year for them in the World Series. I'm going to list a lot of these guys as having strong years last year. That's kind of what you need to win the World Series. But Charlie Morton, another one, a good year. He can be a good number two. Uh, Ian Hernandez in number three. Ian Hernandez. Ian Anderson, rather, in the number three spot. Now, he's a great three. Charlie Morton, probably solid two. Max Freed, solid one. Ian Anderson being able to slot in the three spot is what I think is the Braves' biggest advantage in how these matchups line up against other rotations in the division. You're finishing out the rotation with two other guys. Hugh Oscar Yanoa who's a really young arm. I think he's still just 23. He's going to grow into being a solid pitcher in Major League Baseball. And that's what the Braves are known for, developing these guys. They've been a really good developmental organization. And Yanoa is going to be a good arm one day. Still young, though. Still got to figure some stuff out. Still got to break into the majors and prove that he can throw at this level. I think he can and will prove that. But for the time being, 
he's going to be at the back end of the rotation. And right now, Tucker Davidson, Davidson looks like he's going to slot into that five spot. Now, here's the thing with the Braves. Mike Soroka is still on his way back. They've put a date out, I think, coming up this summer. June or July is the projected date for him to make a return if all stays towards plan. At this point, that could be the start of the MLB season. When Soroka comes back, he is still the ace of this staff to – despite the injury, the Achilles injury that's been plaguing him for two years now, he could be a totally different pitcher. But the talent he's shown in the time that he's healthy proves that he is a clear number one option in Major League Baseball. If he's healthy, this rotation absolutely bumps up. But I don't know what Soroka's going to be. I can't rightfully put them in the top two in the NL East until he comes back, proves he's healthy, and that he is the same pitcher that we saw before these injuries took hold moving on to number two this one pains me too because uh i mean see like the marlins and the nationals they annoy me because they're division rivals but they're kind of outside of that street uh the one like uh world series victory for the nationals that they kind of sold all the guys off for those teams have been kind of quieter you're not too worried about them. well the braves won the world series last year have been a thorn in the philly side for two decades now and this team the history between the phillies and the new york mets yeah, we know there. And there are going to be Mets fans, and Locked On Mets, I'm sure, is going to crucify me for ranking them second in the division in rotation. But this is how I see it. Now, they made the biggest splash of the MLB offseason so far, throwing the absolute bag at Max Scherzer. Scherzer's unbelievable. He's an all-world talent. He's going to be a lock Hall of Famer when everything is all said and done. He's one of the great pitchers in the history of the game. And they added to, the two, oh, yeah, some guy, Jacob DeGrom, who's just absolutely unhittable when he's healthy. So now this rotation reached Jacob DeGrom, Max Scherzer, Taiwan Walker, Cookie Carrasco, and Tyler McGill. Uh, yeah, that's pretty damn good. If you look at – don't even worry about three, four, and five. And that's no knock to Taiwan Walker, who's a solid young arm. Cookie Carrasco, who's a vet, a crafty vet, who is not what he used to be during his heyday in Cleveland, but he's still a serviceable back-end starter. And Tyler McGill, who will have to prove himself and prove that he belongs. I think he's only 26. He's still settling into major league pitching, and he's got a little bit of time to grow into his potential. But this rotation, you just have to look at the first two guys. Those two guys could be the top two pitchers in all of baseball, definitely in the National League, and certainly in the NL East this year if they play out to their projections. I'm not guaranteeing they're going to do that. Scherzer's going to have to get settled into an organization that seems to be cursed. The Grom is going to have to stay healthy. But those two guys, coupled with a solid back end of the rotation, that's a scary prospect for hitters. When you go into New York and you walk into City Field, that's going to be – a rough series for anybody in baseball with those two guys being the first two arms that you see in a series. But I know, I know. Am I being biased? Maybe a little bit, but I think the numbers speak for themselves. Number one rotation in the NL East. I am giving it to the Philadelphia Phillies for this year. Let's just look at it. Zach Wheeler is the NL Cy Young runner-up. He should have won the award, I think over Corbin Burns. Burns had a great season. Whatever. That's another conversation for another day. But Zach Wheeler's coming back as the clear ace of the staff. We'll see how he follows up his NL Cy Young runner-up season. But, man, the dude's nasty. He's partway through a long contract that the Phillies gave him. But, dude, he's in the prime of his career, and he's one of the best strikeout pitchers in all of baseball. He's going to clear 200 strikeouts this year. Promise you. Promise you. Well, unless the season is significantly shortened, which it seems like it will. But he's going to project out that over 162 games, he would have cleared 200 strikeouts. And he's not the only guy. Aaron Nola had a rough year last year. A lot of people here in Philadelphia down on Aaron Nola. I think he's going to have a huge bounce back year. I think he's going to get settled in. I think moving out of that number one spot in the rotation is going to give him a little bit of relaxation, going to give him a new lease on MLB life and allow him to have a bounce back year that's great. Now, how these next three guys slot out, it's questionable. They could fit in any which way. Kyle Gibson was added from Texas last year at the trade deadline. And even though he's a little bit on the back end of his career, a little bit older, he had a solid uh, final stretch to the season last year in Philadelphia. He looked good. He could slot into that three spot. 
You could also go ahead, and one of the surprises of Major League Baseball, Ranger Suarez, you could put him in that role. Suarez had a 1-3-6 ERA last year. That's unbelievable. And I talked with Lindsey Crosby of Locked On MLB Prospects, did a nice crossover with him. We talked about some stats that may belay a regression for Ranger Suarez this year. But even if he regresses a bat, two and change ERA, man, that's still ridiculous numbers. Now, he, he could significantly regress because people are used to him, and he kind of burst on the scene last year as a top-level starter when all things were said and done. But if you move him into that three spot, that's another talented arm. And finally, we've got Zach Eflin, who Eflin was the three on opening day last year for this roster. He had injury issues. He had COVID issues. He missed a significant amount of time during, like, the middle to back half of the Sixers' schedule. Sixers. I got basketball in my mind here in Philly. We're Sixers crazy. Of the Philly schedule. So we'll have to see what he does health-wise. But he could also slot back in, and they could just try and keep that rotation the same. Put Gibson at four. Put Suarez five. That's really a rotation that I feel comfortable with any of those guys in the three-hole, which means that if Ranger Suarez slots out as the three, which is what we'll just say based on ERA last year, if he's in the three spot, Kyle Gibson matches up against other rotations fours. I mean – Kyle Gibson's better than Cookie Carrasco now. Uh, he's probably better at the current time than Huasco you know it just because of age. Uh, he's better than Eliza Hernandez. He's better than Joshua Rogers. He would be the best four in the division. And I could probably say the same about Eflund as a five in the NL East. I mean, the Phillies, they don't have the absolute star power that the National or that the Mets rather or the Braves have at the very, very top, well, I guess that's not even fair. Let's just say just the Mets. But the totality of their rotation, I think, is the best in the MLB. That's where I rank them in the pitching rotation. Tomorrow, we'll have another ranking as we go ahead and let you know where I think the Phillies fit in to the NL East in another aspect. So we'll have that coming up. And next, we're going to do our free agent spotlight. This one, it's an arm, but it's not a starter. We're talking relief pitchers, and this is a veteran that I think could be huge to help the Phillies in 2022 if they decide to sign. We'll be right back. First, though, I want to tell you about our friends over at Bet Online. Now, football season's over, but basketball, it's in full steam. You heard me slipping into the Sixers talk in the first segment. I can't get basketball off my mind right now. And college hoops, the tournament's right around the corner from all the latest odds totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season, and it's not just basketball. It's not just football or baseball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds, right down to they even cover the Olympics. They cover everything across the wide world of sports. So head to their website today, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. I want to thank you again for making Locked On Phillies your first listen every day. And I also want you to check out Locked On MLB Prospects. We just did a crossover with him. Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia. He knows as much about the Phillies prospects as I do, and he knows that for every single major league team. He's going deep on the MLB stars tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. But this next guy, man, this next guy is far from a prospect. We're doing our free agent spotlight today, and that is closing pitcher Kenley Jansen. So Jansen's been in the closer role in Los Angeles for a decade, but he's officially becoming a free agent this offseason. He's got a chance to seek out a new employment, and he's uh, – He's been around a while, so he's probably not going to be all that expensive for a new team to bring him in. Jansen just turned 34 in September, but he's been extremely productive for the Dodgers, even into his 30s. And that's a team that's been going deep into the playoffs for the past couple of years. He's got experience. He's got so many innings logged in just crucial, crucial spots, not just regular season games, playoff games, World Series games. I mean, this past season, he had 38 saves and 43 opportunities. He logged a 2.22 ERA. Come on, man. When have the Phillies had a closer like that? Probably not since, yeah, we'll throw Papelbon out there. Uh, Brad Lidge, like Billy Wagner, 
those guys have been long gone from the Phillies. They need another solid shutdown closer if they're going to be a competitive team in a stacked NL East. I think Jansen could be that guy. He helped the Dodgers to another NLCS win last year, or appearance rather, fell down to the Braves, of course. And the Phillies, they really, really need help on the back end of their bullpen. With Craig Kimmel going back to the White Sox, Jansen's probably the best closer available on the free agent market when everything opens out and this lockout ends. So, Phillies, that's your guy in my opinion. Go out, see what you can do to bring Jansen in here and put him in the back end. Uh, he could take a team-friendly deal to stay in Los Angeles with a team that's much more ready to win than the Phillies are, and I, you could totally understand that. But if the Phillies want to go ahead and outpay the Dodgers for an older, like nearly the back half of 30s closer, they could have themselves their first competent closer since Pat I I hate to even, because I'm not a huge Papelbon fan, but the fact that you look at it, He's their all-time leader in saves for the Philadelphia Phillies in franchise history. Uh, Hector Neris is just – he wasn't really that guy to the extent that the Phillies wanted him to be. He showed flashes, but the consistency wasn't there. I really, really want to see the Phillies go out and get one of these proven veteran closers, and the best one available is Jansen. The best part, because he's so old, not that 34 is ancient. I mean, I don't want to make anyone who's on the back half of their 30s feel bad that's listening to this, but he's ancient in the MLB years. That's a guy that I would love to see get a cheap deal to come to Philadelphia and make a huge impact on the back end of the bullpen. That's our free agent spotlight for today. We've talked a couple shortstops. We've talked an outfielder into Castellanos. We've talked now a relief pitcher in Kenley Jansen. Well, we're going back to the outfield for our next episode. The Phillies need to fill two starting spots in the outfield, and free agency is probably the way that they're going to have to do that now. So our next episode, we will jump in to another outfield pro uh, prospect, another outfield free agent prospect that the Phillies could bring in. Next, I'll give you a little bit of an update on the MLB lockout and the latest talks as we wrap up. But first, I want to tell you about Built Bar. Built Bar is amazing. We're going to be, it's March, tomorrow. February's over. Beach season's right around the corner. Have you kept up with your New Year's resolutions? Yeah, I haven't been great with it either. But Built Bar can help you with that. They've got puffs now that are the first ever protein-infused marshmallow. Got great flavors, tastes amazing. Listen to some of these numbers on the nutritional value in Built Bars. Most Bilt Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. All of that inside a 100% chocolate coating. Man, you cannot beat that. You compare that to a candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of carbs. It, it's no contest. Bilt Bar is so much better for you. And with beach season right around the corner, with summer coming up, with the weather hopefully breaking soon, you got to get into shape. And the best way to do that is substituting in Built Bar. At Built Bar, they're all about the taste. They make it taste delicious first, then figure out how to make it healthy. And I don't know how, but they pull it off every single time. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. This episode's also brought to you by Rock Auto. So there's an ever-increasing number of makes and models of cars. They're coming out every single day with new stuff, it feels like. So why go to the regular store and go through all the stock parts and pieces for your car when something goes wrong? There's no need to do that anymore. You don't have to wait for the person behind the counter to order the parts on their computer. You can do it very easily at home with access to rockauto.com. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. You're going to spend 30%. 50%, some cases even 100% more for the same exact parts when you go to a chain store or car dealership. You got markups and everything like that. You don't want to deal with that. Rock Auto is a family business. They get it. And they've been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low because they've been doing it for so long. They know what works. They've got everything you need. Everything. You can only fit so much in a store. Think about it. There's limitations on size and everything. It only fits so much in a single building. But Rock Auto is not a single building. They're a huge company with everything you need, and they're going to help you 
get your car repaired in the easiest way possible. Go explore their easy to use website today to find a solution to your auto part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in their how did you hear about us section so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices. All the parts your car will ever need, rock auto. Well, I wish I was leaving this episode and the recap, well, the final segment of this episode, rather, was leaving you with better news. But unfortunately, I do want to update you on the news out of the MLB lockout negotiations, and it's not great news. Today, Monday, February 28th, is the self-imposed deadline by the league where it's long been said if talks go longer than this, well, Games are going to have to be canceled in the regular season. Does not seem like a deal is eminent. And there have been loosely veiled threats from basically the league saying they're comfortable with canceling up to a month's worth of games. It's the downside to this is immense. It's catastrophic. Everyone's known this. Rob Manfred, Commissioner Manfred, has come out himself and said that canceling games would be – terrible a a huge failure on behalf of major league baseball to try and get this game going for the fans for the league everything and it looks like they are on the brink of that failure we're in the 11th hour and talks are still pretty far away the players have made huge huge concessions when it comes to the talks and the owners have seemingly laughed them off even in their biggest concessions the owners meanwhile are taking that competitive bargain tax which we talked about in a previous episode, which is basically a quasi-luxury tax. It, it caps how much players can make before teams are taxed excessively because of it. They're only upping it by like a million dollars. Meanwhile, the players wanted up 25, 30, 35 million dollars. There's still such a huge gap between some of the most important numbers that it seems like a deal is not imminent. That seems like unfortunately. The MLB season will be pushed back unless something crazy happens here between the time that I'm recording this and the end of the day's negotiations, which are only a couple of hours away. It seems like we will miss the start of the major league season for the second time in three years. Now, one was pandemic related. This one is a fault of simply the league. There are no outside sources that cause this. Don't let anyone fool you. This is the fault of the two sides the owners and the players, the pettiness that exists between the two of them, and it's led to us missing missing opening day baseball this year, most likely, and who knows how far it'll go. Will we get 100 games in? Will we get 80 games in? Will we get 60 games in? Your guess is as good as mine at this point. All I know is the sides are still very much far apart. Rob Manfred, after 40 minutes today in the first meeting session, has already walked back to his side of the stadium that they're doing the meetings at. I mean, there's just no imminent deal on the table, according to all of the insiders. And unfortunately, that means that we're going to be looking at a little bit longer of an offseason. The good news is you have me here at Locked On Phillies and the rest of our Locked On Major League Baseball network to go ahead and help get you through this tough time in baseball's history. I wish it was better news. I wish I could come on here and tell you, oh, yeah, Major League Baseball has a deal. But that just uh, does not seem to be the case at the current time. It's a shame. And all we can hope for now is that when this deadline passes, it spurs enough action to have a quick resolution that allows them to get in the maximum number of games for the Major League Baseball regular season this year. It's unfortunate. It's not what... Any of us wanted to hear, but it's the reality of a situation for two sides that just can't seem to get their own selfishness and pettiness out of the way to make baseball happen for a a fan base that really, really needs it right now. Thanks for making Locked On Phillies your first listen every day. Appreciate it. Make sure you're subscribed to us on YouTube. We're going to start putting YouTube videos out right now. You're watching this video on YouTube, you can. Or if you're listening to the podcast, pop over to YouTube. Give us a subscribe. Give us a like. Check out what we've got going on. You'll have a lot more content from me day in and day out, despite the MLB season probably not going off as planned. We don't stop working here 
at the Locked On Podcast Network. You got all that information from me. And now make your second listen, Locked On MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, make sure you call him Sully. He brings you his unique perspective on the major leagues past and present. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. That'll do it for today's Locked On Phillies episode, and I will talk to you next time.